Sunday evening, if you haven't seen it, I preached a sermon. Um, and I, what I did is I looked at, and of course, this could have a, been a five or six part series quite easily. But I looked at Psalm 2, Psalm 110, uh, Isaiah 42, verses 1 through 4, and 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 and following. And basically what I presented was this. When you talk about eschatology in most contexts in the past, you've been talking about uh, people trying to identify who the Antichrist is. People trying to connect the rise of the European Union with the ten-headed beast uh, of Revelation. Uh, people commenting that a Apache attack helicopter looks somewhat like the locust in the book of Revelation. Or you end up bogged down in charts and discussions of how you map Daniel onto Matthew 24, onto Revelation whatever. And I burned out on that eschatology a long, long time ago uh, in Bible college. And eventually, I don't know, I forget what year it was, sometime this century anyways. It's, you know, we're, we're 21 years in and I'm still not used to saying this century. It still feels odd. Um, but sometime in this century, I listened to a study from an amillennial perspective that talked about this age, the age to come. I said, that sounds good. And so I said, that's, that's what I'll, that's where I'll go. But it wasn't any kind of, uh, I read 10 books and I read all the other views. Cause I had already, I was raised in the pre mill perspective. So I already had those books. Um, even when I decided, you know, I should dig deeper into this. I just didn't have the, it just didn't, I didn't have the passion to do it. And I knew in my mind, this is a weak area. This is, this is, you shouldn't have an area of systematic theology where you're just sort of like, mm, could we not? And part of it, I know, was just the heat that it, the, the fact that, even good brothers and sisters that I know of, for some reason, you start talking about that one subject, and it's like, <sighs> and you can't just sit down and have a meaningful chat and conversation about, well, what do you think? Well, I take a different view of that. Oh, okay. Um, no, it's, it's like, it's always warfare. And it's just like, I've got enough warfare in other areas. I don't want to get into it. Obviously, going to Apology at Church, uh, Jeff and Luke and Zach would all identify themselves as post millennialists. And so uh, Jeff's preaching through Matthew chapter 24, very helpful to me. I'm sitting there, I'm learning. I'm going, wow, well, hadn't thought about that. You know, let's, uh, let's think about that. And then early on, I mean, before I was an elder there, uh, the guy said, here, here's Joseph Boot's book. Here it is free advertising in the back there uh, from Ezra Institute, uh, The Mission of God, uh, A Manifesto of Hope for Society. It's post-millennial. Um, it's theonomic, general equity theonomic. Um, it um, is anti-radical uh, two kingdoms. Um, and it's just so well done and it was very challenging. And I, I got done, actually I listened to it and I got done with it and I'm like, all right, I need some more books because it's not that there's not other stuff going on in the world, but um, I started to see then that okay, I've got to I've got to come to conclusions on this. Uh, there, there, I, I can't I can't keep putting it off. And so the one this was the first book that I had that I had read that was a positive presentation of postmillennialism. I look, the fact of the matter is most people hold an eschatological position and they haven't read any other position but their own. All they've heard is someone saying that position is wrong because of X, Y, and Z. 
right? I mean, that's where most people are. Most people do not sit there and read a four views book and go, uh, that one. Okay. Um, most people, you've been raised with the tradition or something along those lines. Your favorite radio preacher does that. And so I think I'll go that direction. Fine. So I get the books. I start figuring out who's who. But I'm still interrupted by lots of other stuff going on. Until all this stuff started last year. And so I'm already getting a diet from Jeff and Luke and Zach and stuff. But then last year starts. And now the emphasis is upon where are we going in the future? And what if we're, how do we, because when I had joined, I had talked with the guys and I'm like, you know, I, I understand where you're coming from. I just want to make sure you understand that I, I see periods of intense judgment and darkness. And they said, oh yeah, the idea that post-millennialism means everything is get better and better and better and better, just a straight line up to everybody's converted is ridiculous. That's not how it's happened in the past. There've been the ups and downs and God judges nations and cultures and sure, you, fine. So when I really started thinking about the Great Reset, what's going on, the rise of global technocratic totalitarianism, which is all around us, um, and what that was going to mean, especially for people who are grandfathers. Because I'm going to tell you, I've said this on this program before, the things that change you, you get married, that changes you. You have kids, that changes you. Your kids have kids, and that changes you more than you'd ever expect it to. Just all there is to it. It changes your perspective. You finally start seeing long-term in a way that you just can't until... You're looking in the eyes of that precious little girl, that precious little boy. And that's your kids' kids. And that means they're going to have kids. And then they're going to have kids. And you really have to start thinking long, long, long term. And I had not been along. There are certain eschatologies that do, do not fit well with long term thinking. And so as I started struggling with that, then I started asking the serious questions and digging into the question, can you get to an eschatology that isn't based upon trying to figure out what 10-headed monsters look like or what they're supposed to represent? And that's when I read Greg Bonson. Um, I've got Ken Gentry. Obviously, I've, you know, I've even spoken in years past at conferences with Gary DeMar. Um, and yes, I've been listening to Doug Wilson as well. Uh, blog and May blog and everything else. Yeah, that's nice. Um, and uh, going out to man camp, for example, I had already come to my conclusions, but I watched uh, an excellent video um, that I mentioned in the, in the sermon. Uh, on earth as it is in heaven. And there was a 25 minute conversation that's on, I think put out by cross politic with Toby Sumter, Doug Wilson and Gary DeMar. Uh, that basically says, well, what now? Once you embrace this perspective, what now? And, and I found that extremely useful, extremely helpful. But what, when people have been saying, well, what tipped the scales for you? If I'd, I had a friend just today, and by the way, I, most of my friends have been like, eh, now I'm gonna have to really think through that. Oh, thanks a lot. Uh, and they, but they mean it in the proper way. Uh, my, my good friends have been like, well, okay, all right. So there you are, you're a post-millennialist now. Oh, well, all right, well, um, haven't really given it a lot of thought, but um, listen to your sermon and well, I, that's Psalm 2, that's Psalm 110. That's, I, they, they do seem to be saying the same things. And then they're, they're quoted all the time in the New Testament, so you've got the apostles quoting, and now I'm going to have to think that through. And I appreciate that. I appreciate the response that I've gotten from that. Especially because they all know I'm not going to be beating down their doors going, okay, now it's your turn. Um, that's 
that's not the thing. What happened for me, really, if, if there was one line, just one line that I would point to and say, it's when this hit me that, that I went, oh, yeah. I, it, it all of a sudden you know, goes and clicks together. It is from a text that we have memorized in the current catechism question we're doing in church. We do catechism. Uh, people who think we're just crazy, I don't know what, at Apologia, we actually, we do a catechism question in every service. And our kids learn the catechisms. And that's how we are. And right now we're doing the question from Keech's Baptist Catechism about the offices of Christ and the, the third office, how does Christ function? How does he fulfill the function of king? And the verse says, plural, and I'm thankfully thankful it was verses, that we chose to memorize were Psalm 110, 1 and 2. Now, Psalm 110, 1 is the verse that is quoted most often in the New Testament of any book, of any verse in the Old Testament. Genesis 15, 6, Psalm 110, 1, um, Psalm 2 is up there. These are verses that are repeatedly cited, and hence clearly as a part of the apostolic testament. If what happened in Luke 24, where Jesus opens the scriptures to the disciples, and if that's sort of our paradigm, then you know that Jesus opened those texts up because his disciples then quote from them over and over and over again in their writings. So Psalm 110.1, I know all about because why? I've been debating that one with Unitarians. This is the Anthony Buzzard abused text. Yahweh says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And so you, you have Yahweh speaking to my Lord. And remember, Jesus uses this as the means of stumping the Jews. He asks them, all right, if the Messiah is the son of David, then how can David call him Lord? And then he quotes Psalm 110.1. The Lord says, my Lord says, right here. And they can't answer him because they don't understand how the Messiah can be more exalted than David himself is. They don't understand the incarnation. And the crowd likes to hear that. And it's interesting in both Matthew and Mark, this is where uh, Jesus says, how is it that David says, en numity, by the Spirit, emphasizes that this was said by the inspiration of the Spirit of God. But then look at verse 2, because we memorized verse 2. Yahweh will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion. So the Yahweh who says, sit in my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool for your feet. That Yahweh says, I will, he will stretch forth your, the Messiah's, strong scepter from Zion, saying, and then using an imperatival form in the Hebrew, um, and that is translated accurately in the Greek Septuagint, by the way, rule in the midst of your enemies. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Not rule up in heaven while your enemies run everything on earth. Not rule in a small little corner, and they don't even know you're there. That would not be the function of a scepter of strength. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Now you might say, well, how do you know that that's being fulfilled in Jesus? Because maybe it's just verse one. Well, what is, what is verse four of Psalm 110? The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. What? You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Oops. That gets quoted a lot about Jesus, doesn't it? Yeah. So the whole psalm is about Jesus. 
And this is about his rulership amongst his enemies in power. And when I looked at Katakuriyue in the Greek Septuagint, so kata and then to, it's the verbal form of kurios to rule as Lord. You connect that with what already came in Psalm 2, bring justice to the nations, and the command there between the Father and the Son, ask of me and I will give you the nations as your inheritance. And this is about his, in, his uh, enthronement, because that's what, that's what Acts 13 says. When he's raised from the dead, see at the right hand of the Father. That's what this is about. That's what Daniel 7 is about. And in that context, ask, I will give you the nations for your inheritance. Did Jesus forget to ask? And so then, don't have time to go through Isaiah 42, but there's a bunch of stuff there. Then you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and you have the true eschatology passage. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20 is about as eschatological as you can possibly get. And I'm going really fast here because I already did this already, but one, I never spell things correctly. First Corinthians chapter 15, most of us just sort of look at this and go, well, that's the resurrection chapter. Yeah, it is. But notice, but now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. So, we're talking overarching issues here, right? We're, we're, not, we're not talking about um, that strange passage in Matthew about some of the dead coming out of the, and going and greeting people in the Holy Jerusalem, and it's the only thing it's ever said about. No, this is overarching. This is the big picture stuff, okay? So, for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive but each in his own order. So just as in Romans 5, you have the two humanities, one in Adam, one in Christ. Here, you have the same thing. And you have an order, an autogmity, in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then those who are Christ at his coming, then Ita ta telos, then comes the end. When he hands over, he delivers the kingdom to God, even the Father. When? When he has abolished Pasan Arcane, Kai Pasan Exousion, Kai Dunamin. He has abolished all rule and every authority and power. He has abolished it. Now, how does he do that? How does he do that? I had just the sort of this general idea. You get to the end and everything's fallen apart and, you know, left behind uh, lawnmower <laughs> running, running in the, in the yard because the guy who was mowing his lawn just got raptured and his sneakers are sitting there or something. I don't know. And cars are crashing and planes are falling out of the sky. And it's just an instant boom. And so the day before, the enemies of Christ were flourishing. And they were corrupting children and they were corrupting governments and they were just having a heyday. And then, boom. And maybe seven years later, if you get into all the pre trip, mid trip, post trip, all that kind of stuff, then maybe seven days, power comes down and you got blood up to the horse's bridles. And that's how he does away with all these powers is instant Armageddon. Until I realized that what's in the background of this text, especially verse 25, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. He must reign. It's a process. And yeah, you could just spiritualize it if you wanted to. You could just say, well, he's going to reign the church and the church is going to be this small little group over here. And, and it's, uh, you know, this little light of mine. And you can, you can do that. But it's a process. And if Psalm 2, Psalm 110, Isaiah 42, 
are the context for what Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, then it's a process of victory. It's a process where he has, look at the language, for he must reign, what did we see in Psalm 110? Katakoriao, to to reign. He must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. That's Psalm 110.1. That's bringing justice to the nation, Psalm 2. That's what the servant does. And that was the other thing that caught me in Isaiah 42. Because Matthew quotes that whole section from Isaiah 42. And it was about not not breaking the reed and, and the flickering flame. And I've never understood what in the world that was about. I never got it. I'm almost 60 years old. I never got it. You might say, you're stupid. Okay, I am. But I never got it. I I just I, I don't know how. But the before and after, it's he will bring justice. He will do justice. And how does he do it? Like the leaven in the lump. It slowly goes through all of it. The kingdom grows. And it goes from a small seed to the huge plant. And it does so slowly. Almost imperceptibly. Not whammo! Armageddon power. So he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his foot. And the last enemy that will be abolished is death. This is the most eschatological. I mean, the term eschatos occurs in verse 26. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. And so all of a sudden I'm like, these are the controlling texts. And so the difference is and this is why I'm, you know, there's already people out there that they want to argue about this thing over here and that thing over there. And I go, wait, wait, you know what I find so attractive about this? You know why I don't care that people are going to dismiss me and all the rest of that? This starts at the top, creates the structure, and then orders everything downward. It's consistent. It's It starts with the main and plain texts. And so far, I haven't seen anybody who has argued that, well, no, Psalm 2 isn't about Psalm 110. And that's not continued. That thread's not continued in Isaiah 42. And it just happens to be that those seem to be the verses that the apostles are quoting all the time in the Bible about Jesus in the New Testament. No, no one has tried to argue that, well, you know, no, those, those texts really aren't connected to one another. So if they are, the technical term for this is intertextuality. You have a theme in the Old Testament that then becomes fulfilled in the New. And when Paul, in talking about eschatology, eschatos ekros, 1 Corinthians 15, 26, uses the same terminology from Psalm 110, you have to go, oh, this is purposeful. This is purposeful. And that makes you sit back and look at the Great Commission. And again, I'm sure he's not the first one to have said it, but he emphasizes it. Doug Wilson says it well. He says, if you simply go to make disciples and you don't therefore go, you're sinning. What? Well, think about the end of Matthew. Jesus comes to disciples and he says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples. You see, if Jesus didn't have the, all the authority in heaven and earth, then he doesn't have the right to tell you to go make disciples of all nations. But because he has all authority in heaven and on earth, therefore, go. Because you're representing the king. You're representing his commands. Therefore, go. Now, it seems to me, real quickly, that one of the primary pushbacks I've gotten is that, well... An optimistic amillennialist says this all the same things. You don't, you don't need all the rest of that stuff. You don't, you don't need to have to 
go to the lengths of post millennialism. You, yeah, we 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 believe all, all believe all that. Really, where it comes down to where where I can't go. Well, yeah, okay, you know, uh, we're all saying the same thing. There, certain of my friends is that ah, there's not there's not a bit of difference between the two positions. I think there is, and I think where it comes out is that if Jesus has all authority on earth and we are his followers, then we have to tell the people who will someday stand before him in judgment that they are under his authority as well. We can't just keep that within the church. We have to call the nations to obedience and to justice, real justice, biblical justice. That's what I see to be the power of recognizing the centrality of these texts. They are the ordering texts. Every, every doctrine has them. Every doctrine has places where scripture roots a truth and then orders everything that goes around it. We all know that. And here they are. Here they are. I think it has everything to do with answering the question of what are we going to do if in fact, and I raise this in a sermon, if Jesus is subduing every one of his enemies, have you ever seen a greater enemy than secularism? Secularism in its essence is a denial of the Lordship of Christ in every aspect of life. With the rise of Darwinism, you have the negation of every aspect of what Jesus came to do. The Bible tells us that all of life is purposeful and designed. The new religion of man says all of life has no purpose and is random. Therefore, there is no judgment. There is no transcendent meaning. It is the absolute negation of everything that Christ stands for and proclaims to be true. How do you destroy secularism? How do you wipe it from the collective memory of mankind? Well, I suppose you could just do it. Just, hey, you know, if Christ wants to come tomorrow and do that, fine. I'm not going to, I'll, I'll, look, as long as we're in heaven together, I'll take the jabs of all the amillennialists that want to, want to throw that out there. That's fine. But if he follows the same process that he has in the past, if Christ has been ruling in the midst of his enemies for 2000 years here on earth and has been subjugating them, and I think I could argue that he has, then what if the way he chooses to do this, this greatest enemy, is to give the world over into the power of that enemy for a period of time. Great darkness. There's been periods of great darkness in the past in human history that we all look back upon and go, mm, not doing that again. Let that system destroy itself. It could be very costly. And become a monument to its foolishness. So that would never be repeated again. Is that possible? You have to have an explanation as to why we're going to be facing the things we're facing, the tribulation and trouble that we are facing. And you have to have an explanation as to what motivates you in your Christian worldview to do everything in your power to communicate the faith to the generation and the generation and the generation after that to come through the darkness. Through the darkness. Escapism ain't going to do it. Escapism ain't going to do it. And I'm not saying that's all there is, but escapism isn't going to do it. Those are the things that were motivating me. Those are the things that were pushing me along. Uh, as I said, I mentioned um, that video that would be of assistance to some people. Uh, Joe Boots' book, Mission of God. Uh, Greg Bonson's book on postmillennialism. Only the first half, because he didn't actually write the book. Greg Bonson didn't write half the books are under his name today. Stuff that he wrote has been collected together over time. and put together and 
And so about the first half was really his argumentation on all the forms of millennialism and things like that. And as you would expect from Greg Bonson, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, not much wiggle room in there. Uh, and of course, you know, folks like uh, Gary DeMar, Ken Gendry have been cranking stuff out for a, for a long, long time. Very, very useful materials that I would uh, suggest you take a look at if you want to further analyze and consider. So there you go. There's that.